Okay. Good morning. Good to have you here. I'm sure the others will come in soon. We're going to be looking in our foundations classes this morning on what was the last foundations class on? Somebody remember? Kyle taught it. I remember. I'm sure you do. A theology of singleness. So, what would be the logical next lesson? Theology of marriage. A theology of marriage is a next lesson. We're looking at just creation principles that God created. And we need to remember as we go through a theology of marriage that these principles, marriage is something instituted at creation. It is not something that came when Jesus died. Therefore, it is good for all. It's, and the marriage covenant stands for all people, saved and unsaved alike. If it had been something instituted by Christ for the church, we could say, okay, those who are not saved are off the hook. But they're not. Um, the principles God set forth in marriage go back to creation. And whenever there is a creation principle, whenever the Bible appeals to creation, then it is neither cultural nor new covenant alone. It is a principle. So marriage is not a cultural construct either. It's something that God created. So a theology of marriage, what is marriage, we may ask? <clears throat> the big idea Marriage is a lifelong covenant between one man <coughs> and one woman defined and acted by God that is designed to bear fruit and showcase God's special, intimate love towards his people. It is designed to bear fruit. There are certain things God has in mind for marriage <coughs> that can only be <laughs> experienced only be shown, only be showcased to the world if marriage is done the way he wants it done. We can't reinvent marriage and expect it to bring fruit that showcases his glory to the world. So marriage is something that God does and God defines. Now when we say God does and God defines it, we have our cultural ways of going about and... Um, joining somebody. Here in the U.S., we have some witnesses, and we get together, and we have somebody pronouncing them married, but not every culture does it that way, um, and, it, and it's okay because it is something that God does. When a culture says, this is what we're going to do, they're basically appealing to God to seal that union, so it's not something that, it doesn't matter if not everybody, every culture does it alike, as long as it is recognized that these couples are coming together in a union, to form a union that God honors in a God-honoring way. So what I'm saying is if you go to Africa, some of the cultures, they go about it very differently, their weddings, than we do here. God still honors that because it's something God does, not man. Man just makes an appeal and makes an appeal to God to honor that. Genesis 1, verse 27. Does somebody want to look that up and read it? Just volunteer. I'll, pass, I'll give several references. Okay. And also Genesis 2, verses 22 <coughs> through 24. Did I hear somebody? Yeah. Josh, okay. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Go ahead. Genesis 2, 22, 24. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Do you all remember the story in the Gospels when the scribes and Pharisees came and asked Jesus a question on marriage? He said he appealed to these verses that in the beginning he made them male and female. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was appealing to creation as the basis on which we build our doctrine on marriage. He went all the way back to the beginning. Jesus said from the beginning it was not so. We go back to creation 
to appeal to that. So in these verses here, what do we see as creation principles for marriage? Read Genesis 127. I'll read, <coughs> I'll reread it to you. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So how was mankind created? Male and female. Now the next verses, verses 20, uh, chapter 2, verses 22 through 24 say, <laughs> And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman um, and brought her unto the man. How many? How many men, how many women were brought together? One man, one woman. What sex were they? Male, female. He created them male and female in chapter 27. He brought one together with one more. One man with one woman. And Adam said, this is not bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Probably come from womb of a man. It's probably where where the word woman comes from. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they, tw- and they shall be one flesh. So leaving father and mother is another principle. In other words, when you leave and get married, you start your own home. You start your own, <clears throat> could you say, sovereign home over which parents relinquish authority over the children. And the children are now forming their own home. So God created it that man and leaves his father and his mother, takes his wife, cleaves to him, one man, one woman, not two men, not two women. And I think we need to get this, to, uh, get this straight because we're living in a day where there is much confusion in our land concerning these things. I believe there is a spirit of the age that has so clouded the minds of people when we give in and we begin to, as our society has done, Defend the indefensible so as not to hurt people's feelings. We open ourselves up to the spirit of the age and we become blinded. And there's just the gender dysphoria that's taking place is taking over. And now it has gone way, way beyond gender dysphoria. We have people and we need to appeal to this. One man, one woman, male and female created he them. Because today we have people... I was reading the other day, we have people now who are marrying the earth. There are people who are marrying trees, going through ceremonies and embracing them and going through all that. Why? Because we have departed from Genesis, what God created in the beginning. We shake our heads, but do you know if we do not love truth and embrace truth, our children and grandchildren could be facing some of those things. The people who are embracing that, who are burying trees and burying the earth, a generation ago, their parents would have said, laughed like you and I are laughing, and said that could never happen. We have to appeal to creation, the truth of God's word, and we must embrace truth and love truth in our lives, in our generation, if we don't want our children, if we want our children protected from this type of stuff. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, as you, as you gave the ring to one another and have now received it a second time from the hand of the pastor, so love comes from you, but marriage from above from God. In other words, he's just using that a uh, little bit of picture, um, like a pastor in the exchanging of rings. They love each other, and as a pastor pronounces them husband and wife, so also, it, it's just a picture of God actually pronouncing them husband and wife. You love each other, but it is God who does it. As high as God is above man, so high are the sanctity, the rights, and the promise of love. And then he goes on and he says this. It is not your love that sustains marriage, but from now on, the marriage that sustains your love. I love that. Because many times in married life, there's tests come. And yes, marriage 
can get better and better, but it gets better and better as you allow marriage to sustain your love instead of the other way around. In other words, there's time when, the, when married couples frustrate each other. But if you will stay committed to each other and choose to love because you're married and made that covenant promise, you will find that love grow. So it is the marriage that sustains the love, not the love that sustains the marriage. Although we need love, but what I'm saying is love grows and helps sustain that as we stay committed to the covenant of marriage. Are there, is there any input from anybody before we go on? Amen. So <clears throat> marriage is something that God defines, and we already, <coughs> already <coughs> read that in Genesis 2, verses 22 through 24. So we're not going to go over that again. It is one man and one woman, and we already read Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. How about Matthew 19, verse 4? Somebody want to look that up? So the new, Jesus brings that into the New Testament to define marriage as one man and one woman. Caleb? At the beginning, made them male and female. Okay. He made them male and female, and Jesus is explaining marriage. Man, woman. Therefore, I think he, he continues there probably in verse 5. What does it say in verse 5? Or, and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Okay. Male and female equals husband and wife. So when God defines that, that means this is what God defined as marriage. And anything we do, aside from that definition, is not marriage. If a man or a woman decides to marry a tree, like people are doing, or the earth, is that a marriage? That is no more of a marriage than homosexual couples getting married though our society has defined it, because it has broken God's definition here of marriage. Um, God's definition explains why not just any two people that love each other can be married. Because, well, you know, you see these signs, love is love, with a rainbow on it. Well, that doesn't mean just because you love that man as a man, or this woman loves that woman, that you can be married. God's definition prohibits that. So, and marriage is for life. Somebody want to read Matthew 22, verses 23 through 33. As great as marriage is, it doesn't last past this life. It is but a shadow of great things to come. So this passage is Jesus explaining, while marriage is for life, it it begins in this life and it ends in this life. All right, Matthew, Matthew chapter 22, verse 23 through 33. The same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there is no resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and third, down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the, li- of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Yes, so that means, shows marriage is for this life, until death do us part, after that, they're free. <clears throat> or released from the marriage covenant. When I say free in that way, it's grief in that separation at death. I'm not saying, oh, I'm finally free. I'm just saying they are freed from the obligations to the covenant. 
when they are married, if they are married, the marriage covenant at death. <coughs> so Hebrews 13, verses 4 through 5. It proscribes the bounds of sexual relations backed by the promise of judgment from God. In other words, there, there, are, there are warnings, there are proscriptions given, which means when God created the marriage covenant, he said, this is what you do, and a violation of this, there's a warning of judgment with that violation. Somebody want to read that, that in Hebrews 13, 4 through 5? <clears throat> Go ahead, Micah. Sam, you can maybe take the next verse when we get there. Hebrews 13, 4 through 5. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Yes. So there's the proscription given on marriage. God blessed marriage as he intended. He brought man and woman together, one man, one woman together for life, as we saw in Matthew, and said, be fruitful and multiply. The bed is undefiled and so forth. But here's a proscription. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. There is a judgment for those who violate the sanctity of marriage. So, question, why are God's proscriptions, his warnings of judgment and his, against, against violating his, uh, his uh, <clears throat> marriage, I can't think of the word, um, stipulations, whatever, that he, he put in place, why are they not followed today? So, God's prescriptions are not something easily accepted by the human heart. Not everyone can receive this saying, Jesus said, but only those to whom it is given. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Matthew 19, 11 through 12. And we find in there that if somebody just finds himself completely unable to live in victory, Jesus said you're better off just to be becoming a eunuch. Um, neutering yourself to, to remove the temptation rather than facing the judgment of God for having violated that. So, in that context, Jesus said, let him who can receive it, receive it. Listen, this is serious, God is saying. I am giving a picture of my love for the church, for my people, and I so badly want this picture to not be distorted that I will judge those who violate it. But those who are within the union as God gave it creation, God blessed it wholeheartedly. <clears throat> so marriage is something God does. God is the one who makes a marriage. Sam, do you want to look up Matthew 19, verse 5? Matthew 19, verse 5, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Okay. God makes two people into one flesh. Something God does. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Question, why does it matter that God is the one that joins husband and wife? We already referenced that a little bit, but let's discuss that a little more. Why does it matter that it is God who joins husband and wife? Yes? Yeah, if God hadn't done it, it wouldn't be a holy union because only God is holy and holiness cannot come from what is not holy. So only God can join as a holy God. Why does that matter? Any other thoughts? 
Did you have your hand up, Kyle, or not? I did, but I, do you have a thought, I guess? I, okay. Would it be fair to say it's, it's, a, it's not merely a physical transaction, but a spiritual mm -hmm. transaction? I believe it is. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. And there are spiritual implications there too. There's spiritual blessings that go with it. There's spiritual curses that go with a violation of it. So there's definitely the spiritual comes in there. I also <clears throat> if you <clears throat> if you study a lot of the a lot of false religions especially if they get become really deep but anything that has to do with satanic rituals and all that through the, uh, throughout the world, there's often sexual rites that they go through outside of marriage. And there's something spiritual, significant about it, spiritual enough that when that is violated, there's also dark spiritual effects it has on a person's life. So that's why, that's my first thought when you said they're spiritual. There's spiritual blessings when done in God, but the devil knows that there's spiritual curses that can come on a person's life when that is violated. Therefore, as a rite of passage into a lot of satanic stuff that goes on, that is one of the rites of passage because it just opens a door for spiritual curses in our lives. And there's probably a lot of ways we could talk about the implications of the spiritual besides just the physical union. Yes, Arlen. Yes, that was going to be my next one, but I forgot about it. Thank you. If God put it together, Jesus said, let not man put it apart. If God joined husband and wife, only God can break that union. <clears throat> so, I lost my place. Give me a moment. <laughs> So the, the fact that only God can join husband and wife has implications. Implication number one, God is the author of all marriages, both for the believer and the unbeliever. You don't need to be married in the right church to be truly married. <coughs> Even distorted marriages, like distorted image bearers, still reflect the purposes and glory of God. So man was created in the image of God, and when, we, and when Adam and Eve sinned, that image remained. It was distorted, but it remained. We still have the image of God. How do I know that? Because long, long, many years after man sinned, God said to Noah that whoever murders someone, he must be executed. And an animal that kills somebody must also be killed and one of the reasons is that God, because man was created in the image of God. So we know that appeal to the image of God stood even after the fall, however distorted it was. And here he's saying that um, the implication is that even unconverted people are truly married, though the, though the glory of God that he is trying to showcase through marriage may be distorted through unbelievers who are not walking with God, it is still there. It still showcases something. Just like the image of God was distorted and, still show, and we still have the image of God. <clears throat> so implication number two. If, well, why does it matter that God is the one that joins husband and wife? Husband and wives have rights, the Bible says, to each other's bodies. 
the husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and like the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 3 through 5 is what I just read. So God is saying, I created marriage, and I'm telling you, if you're married, don't keep yourselves from each other unless it's for a period of time when you're really seeking God. Just give yourself to each other. And while I don't have total authority over my own body, neither does my wife, neither do married couples. That They are meant... God can give, the, uh, give those direct directives to a marriage if he is the one who created it. So, <clears throat> somebody want to read... Ephesians 5, verses 15 through 21. Tim. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 15. Sorry, my throat's... <clears throat> I should have got tea instead of coffee. Okay, Ephesians 5, 15 through 21. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Was I supposed to start in 22 or is this right? Um, let me check. No, 15 through 21. Okay. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, that's interesting. If you study context of that verse, the last verse there about submitting to one another, husband, wife, directives, it begins with verse 15. It provides... Verses 15 through 20 provide vital context for what Paul says to husbands and wives. The critical imperative is found in verse 18. Can you reread verse 18? And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit as opposed to getting drunk with the wine... <clears throat> everything Paul says next about husband and wife relationships depends upon that part happening, being filled with the Spirit. You can't do it if you're not filled with the Spirit, not the way God wants it. Be filled with the Spirit, which enables, one, a submitting to one another. Being filled with the Spirit enables <clears throat> wives to, to your own husbands. In the Greek, be filled is the verb. Be filled in order to do these. So, submitting to one another. All those directives, and I love that. We often think, how can somebody live this out? That is why somebody who's not filled with the Spirit, they might have a bit of a distorted picture that they're giving. They're showcasing a distorted picture of God's glory, but it's still there, but only through the Spirit of God in our life can we truly live out what God tells us to live out. Now, <clears throat> earthly society, Bonhoeffer also said this, earthly society is only the beginning of a heavenly society. The earthly home, an image of the heavenly home. The earthly family a symbol of the fatherhood of God. So God created marriage to reflect the fatherhood of God, the family of God, and the home as our heavenly home. Marriages reflect the mysterious union of Christ and the church. We could read Ephesians 5, verses 31 through 32. So somebody want to read Genesis 2, verse 18. Yes. Guys, 
Go ahead and read it, yeah. I will make him a, I will make a help meet for him, meaning a helper that is, that is, um, what's the best word for that? that we, the word meet is an ancient word that means fit or fitting for him, that's suitable for him. I'll make him a helper. What does that imply if it's suitable? It implies that man, Adam, was not complete by himself. He needed someone to complete him. And Eve, by herself, was not complete. She needed someone to complete her. But the two together showcased God's glory. Man alone does not reflect God's glory, and woman alone does not reflect God's glory completely, only a part of it. So <clears throat> the first thing the Lord identified as not good in the Bible in the world was that Adam was alone. Not lonely, just alone. Though, idea, though Adam had no idea anything was wrong, maybe he did, maybe he felt something when he saw the animals, maybe he didn't, but it doesn't say. The Lord did not make a woman at the same time he made man in order to make several critical points. One of those points is this. Alone, man cannot reflect the glory and splendor of God's relational covenantal nature. Eve was created to help Adam image God, to help him visibly showcase to the universe what God is like. And though the first marriage imaged God to the universe, the point is that it takes man and woman to showcase who God is. And I'm going to say this quickly. Man and woman, it doesn't necessarily say husband and wife, so that's how it was showcased, and showcases it best. I want us to understand if we are single today, that is not saying we can't showcase God's glory to the earth. I'm saying man and woman both, whether they're married or non-married, even, even an unbeliever can look at a man, single man, and he says, you know, that man has a spirit of God. I see part of God in him. And then he looks at a single woman and he says, that single woman also shows me something different about God. Though the two may not be married, man and woman, in that sense, reflect God's glory. So I do believe it takes man and woman to showcase God's glory, but that man and woman can be married or not married. It just, without the two sexes, the fullness of God's glory is not showcased. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that nobody thinks, well, I can't really showcase God's glory in this earth if I'm not married. That's not what it's saying. So what is marriage for? Marriage ultimately is a picture of God and is formed and sustained by His presence. As God made man in His own image, so He made earthly marriage in the image of His own eternal marriage with His people. <clears throat> that was, uh, Bromley said that in Good and Marriage. Piper says this, Staying married is not mainly about staying in love, it's about covenant keeping. I like that. When you become married, you, create, you make a covenant. And a lot of people say, well, I'm just going to break that covenant because I'm, out of, I, I, I'm no longer in love. It's not about staying in love. It's about keeping covenant. Yes, we long and we work on that love. But covenant is the higher goal than the love. The love follows when we follow that covenant, when we keep that covenant. So <clears throat> the great picture that God is trying to create is his covenant love with his people. So we understand. You know, if you want to understand God's heart toward us as his children, how many of you have children? Does your heart not break, rise in defense toward your children? When you think of your children dying, does it not tear you apart? When your child does something wrong, are you ready to disown that child immediately? No. No. Not at all. God, God's love toward us as his children is showcased in our love towards our biological children, our own children. In the same way we get a picture of God's love toward us 
not only as his children, but through marriage. The way we relate to our wives. And if we keep that covenant and are faithful to that covenant, and when there's a disagreement, we don't separate immediately, we begin to see God's commitment to us, his covenant to us. It's not based... See, when we violate God's covenant for marriage and separate immediately from a person because we had our first disagreement and just bang, what are we telling the, uh, what are we telling the world? We're telling the world, we're giving a picture of God's love toward his children the same way. He just rejects us the first mistake we made. But he doesn't. If we follow that covenant love through with our spouses, through thick and thin, that showcases God's covenant commitment towards us, even in our failures. As a result of the depth of the character of God revealed in a marriage, God takes violations to that covenant seriously. Matthew 19, verses 6 and 7. Somebody want to read that? Go ahead, Micah. Somebody want to look up if um, 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. So Matthew 19, 6 and 7. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? Okay. Um, somebody want to read 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17? <coughs> 1 Corinthians 6, 16 and 17. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Yes. So God, it, those are just verses saying how seriously God takes the violation of that covenant, which is faithful to each other till death do us part. A man is not, John Henderson says, a man is not called to love his wife as she deserves, but as Christ deserves. A refusal to love our wives for any reason whatsoever is not firstly a statement about our wives or even our view of our wives, but it is firstly a statement about Jesus Christ and our view of Jesus Christ. In other words, if we're called to reflect, if we're called to reflect the covenant of God with his people, if that's what marriage does, then loving our wives, we will love them whether they are worthy of it or not because we're doing it as to Jesus. We're, we're doing it out of our love for Jesus. It is not because our wives always deserve it and vice versa. A, a woman loving her husband is not because her husband always deserves it because Christ always deserves it. And, you're, and Christ is the one who is being glorified through it. Because Christ is worthy of our love, therefore we love our spouses. So lead as Christ led. Christ's love was not passive, but active in seeking the salvation of his church and offering of his life as an atonement. Christ gave protection, spiritual and physical, he gave provision, spiritual and physical. Husbands are to lead as Christ did. Husbands aren't perfect like Christ, so don't hear this as a license to abuse authority, but rather a weighty responsibility for which we as husbands will give account to God. We will give account to God as husbands for either abusing that authority or not leading out and, and allowing our our wives to flounder. Um, somebody asked me just recently what to do in a situation where the husband is um, refusing to work and is selling everything out from under them, their home, everything's being sold, and the wife is in a frazzle trying to provide. He, she can't afford to live anymore, and he's sitting on the computer all day and wanting to refusing to get a job, and then it just, they're, they're headed for the poorhouse. What do you do? That is something we men will give account to God for. Treating our wives that way. We're supposed to provide for them. 
And if we don't provide for them, we're worse than an infidel, the Bible says. Worse than somebody who doesn't even believe in God. So we are called to provide for them. Christ didn't treat us that way. We don't treat our wives that way. A wife also now, turn this around, is not called to submit to her husband as he deserves, but as Christ deserves. A wife's refusal to live in respectful and joyful submission to her husband is firstly and primarily a reflection of her low view of Jesus Christ. In her eyes, he is not worthy of her submission. After all, Jesus submitted to his father in becoming a man, in becoming a slave, in being mocked and crucified. Wives are not called to be mocked and crucified, simply to be respectful and honoring toward their husbands. With your marriage, you are founding a home that needs a rule of life and this rule of life is so important that God establishes it himself because without it everything would be out of joint everything is out of joint when we do not follow God's prescriptions for marriage prescriptions and proscriptions both when they're not followed everything is out of joint you may order your home as you like except in one thing The wife is to be subject to her husband and the husband is to love his wife. Bonhoeffer said that. Submission, what is submission? Submission, Piper says, submission is a divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. I love that. It's not a picture of a wife is just crushed while the husband does his thing and the wife just tags along saying well I'm just following my husband's wake it is this idea the husband is to lead out but he can't do it unless the wife comes alongside and joins him in what God has called them to do and joins him and helps him with the gifts God gave her you see when God tells the husband to lead out he's telling the wife help him in that. He can't do it without you. Therefore, her input is very important. And too many times we have distorted that and abused it by taking the word submission and just crush someone. And just, no, you just stay in your place and let me do what I'm called to do. No, it's let us do what God has called us to do. Because without your gifts, my wife, I can't do this. Any input? Phil. First, uh, Peter uh, 3, 7. It says, likewise, you... This is kind of an interesting uh, a verse. I think of this an awful lot. <laughs> I'll read it to the end, you know what I mean? Likewise, you husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving... Likewise, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as uh, being heirs together for the grace of life. And this is it, that your prayers be not hindered. It's kind of an interesting, certainly the union represents the gospel, and that should be our high call, and that should be paramount. But I often think about that. What does that mean, prayers are not hindered? It's a stipulation for marriage, I see, for marriage folks. It's not for single folks. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of a, uh, an asset and a liability if it's done right. It's right, but if it's not, they're hindered somehow. And I don't exactly know how that is, but with fear and trepidation, I don't want to go there either. Yeah. I love that verse because I think that verse is something we as husbands, men, often overlook. It is a proscription, a warning. If you do not, if we as husbands do not live with our wives according to knowledge, what knowledge? Giving honor to her as the weaker vessel. In other words, if we are not there lovingly, supporting, helping her emotionally, physically, catering to her and such, heaven is going to be as brass when we go to pray. Start getting angry and yelling at your wife and then go pray. God, yeah. God says, no, I'm, your, your prayers aren't going anywhere. Uh, yeah. 
put your wife through an emotional turbulence, put her through, just abuse her, do not understand, don't dwell with her according to understand, don't tell me you're filled with the Spirit and that God is answering your prayers. He's not. That's a very, very sobering verse for me that has many times caught me. Am I understanding my wife and am I loving her and nurturing her in a way that builds her up? If not, our prayers will be hindered. And I believe many a man today is wallowing around thinking he's trying to serve God and he's not going anywhere. Why? Because his prayer life isn't going anywhere. Why not? Because he's not living with his wife according to knowledge. That shows again, you cannot abuse your wife. That submission is so that she admits to your tender care and provision for her. And women love that, by the way. Why is it that women are drawn to men who are strong, leaders and all that? Because they want to feel safe with a man. It's, it's, put, it's built into them to want to feel safe with someone. There's more we could say, but I'm going to close. Um, there's a little bit we could say about children yet. Uh, procreation, procreation from uh, marriage, but we're out of time. So God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>